Babylon to pole on every step across the ocean. The ruling classes, them is in a mess. Oh yes, the capitalist system are regress. But the Soviet system now progress. So which one of them you think is best? When are the two of them the worst? Well, I hope you are very warm where you are watching from. It's quite a cold day here in Cape Town, yet we welcome you to another episode of Workers World. I'm your host, KD Mashile. Thank you for joining us. Over the years, the show has focused on the ESCOM crisis and its impact on the working class people. The state-owned entity that generates electricity has ensured power outages, or as you would know it, load shedding, which has impacted our daily lives. The steep increases of the prices of electricity, and lately it also seems the threat to the ESCOM workers' job security. In today's show, we focus on the latest developments in the context of the new dawn and implications for the ESCOM workers and the working class communities. To join me on this discussion on today's show, we have a panel consisting of the following people. Right next to me, we have Ms. Sandra Fanny Kerk, who is a researcher at the Energy Democracy Program at AIDC. Welcome. Thank you. And alongside Ms. Sandra, we have Usoso Fisa, who is the secretary at the Western Cape Office of the National Union of Mine Workers. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Katie. And also on the round table, we have Ms. Vinola Marken, who is the coordinate, the energy justice coordinator at SAFSI. Thank you for being with us. Good evening, and thank you for having us. It's a warm welcome uh, to all of you, and thank you for making the time to be with us on today's show. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to kick off the discussion, Ms. Sandra, can you give us a brief background and an overview of the situation at ESCOM? How did we get here? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think the here that we, that we are at is the, the crisis that everybody knows about because it's a crisis of load shedding but it's also a crisis of high levels of energy poverty so i think we, we need to be aware that you know it's not it's not just the middle classes who have been suffering load shedding over the years it's the working class communities who don't actually have access to electricity who can't afford electricity who are also in crisis but having having said that um Perhaps to look at the institution or the or the, the the institution of Eskom and what are the crises facing Eskom as an institution, the biggest is probably the financial. Well, no, maybe not the biggest, but a, a huge crisis is the financial problems. Eskom has something like close to 500 billion rand debt, um, so it's it's fine. I mean, it's you know the the the. Bailout that the government is has has said it'll it'll um, give give Eskom might not even solve the problems mm. of the financial problems of Eskom. We can go into more detail about why the financial problems, but you know it's facing huge financial problems. Um, it's also facing enormous um, governance issues. So we know that Eskom has been heavily implicated in the state capture narrative. It's you know big allegations of corruption. Um, particularly around coal um, uh, contracts. Um, you know, we've seen uh, leadership has changed. There's been a huge turnover of leadership, major uh, governance problems in Eskom, um, and, inst and infrastructure problems. So mm. it, it, it doesn't, it, it has, uh, the, the reason why we've been load shedding is because it hasn't been able to generate sufficient electricity okay. for demand at particular times. So, so if I can just sort of summari summarize that and say that on top of those problems, um, what, what, you know, what Eskom is also having to grapple with is the whole issue of climate change mm. and what the implications of climate change are for a state utility which relies on coal, burning coal for its electricity generation. Um, and in that context, I think Eskom is now facing, um, the government has said, well, the way to solve these problems is to unbundle Eskom. So I think that's, in summary, the, the, the crises that Eskom is facing. No, and I think that actually gives us quite um, 
a good introduction to kick off the show. Um, you had something to add to us? Yeah, I think when we deal with the issues of ESCO, it's important that we don't look back in the last three years. We must look at what has been happening in ESCOM during the apartheid era period when contracts for coal were signed at prices that were to be very ridiculous today. The primary driver of ESCOM costs today is the primary energy. You look at the amount we pay for coal compared to the normal price of coal out there. Parallel to that, the very same conglomerates that we have signed contracts with at exorbitant prices have signed contracts with ESCOM to sell electricity to them at far ridiculous cheaper prices, less than the cost price of ESCOM. That is the first part and first point that we need to look at. Secondly, we need to look at the issue of corruption at ESCOM, which has been deep-rooted for far too long. And we have a very firm belief that corruption is still there at ESCOM and that the efforts that we are seeing haven't yielded any results because we haven't seen any imprisonment mm -hmm. of anybody. Then you have government decisions that were taken by Department of Energy during the era of Jeff Hadebe to say ESCOM be forced to purchase electricity through the power purchase agreements at prices that ESCOM cannot even sell the electricity to the consumers for. So that is amongst issues that we are confronted with that have got to where we are now. Mm -hmm. Moreover, you had municipalities that get electricity from ESCOM mm -hmm. to sell to the ordinary citizens. The ordinary citizens and local businesses purchase electricity from these municipalities. But the municipalities do not return the money to ESCOM. As a result, ESCOM ends up producing electricity for free from the municipalities and its business as usual for the executives. And yet, it is the workers of ESCOM that have to bear the brand having produced electricity for free. Okay. Um, you speak to what um, Sandra spoke about um, on the debt that is that ESCOM is under, which is, I think is one of the biggest problems as you have said, Sandra. So I just wanna find out, do, do we know what is causing this debt over and above that some municipalities are not paying and how can those challenges actually be addressed? Yeah, uh, um, just to start by adding to the background, um, in fact, ESCOM was started in 1923. Okay. Um, ironically, to to make electricity more affordable and to make it more accessible. And today, ESCOM is, um, have become the monster where poor people have to tighten their belts because every year there is an ask for higher electricity prices mm. to increase the tariffs. And that is the situation where we are now. Um, over the past uh, while, like my colleague here said, um, the, the mismanagement and the maladministration and the... Um, um, corruption, government officials have um, gotten themselves into the money pot where money is being sent to, to ESCOM, but when it gets there, we don't know what it, it's supposed to go to distribution, to transmission, and to actually make more electricity. But a, a cut of that money first go, a couple of billion go somewhere else that we still need to find out, and we need to, to investigate and follow the money as they say. Yeah. Where where did this money go? Yeah. And, and that is a problem. Um, it w we are not managing the money properly. And um, I, I'm, I'm disputing the fact that, that ESCOM has debt. ESCOM doesn't have debt. It has got money that has been stolen that must be brought back so that our economy can, can run properly. Because ESCOM is one of the biggest providers of energy at the moment in our country. Okay, that is, that is um, a mouthful that the money, and I think that's um, a, a, a different way of looking at it, that the money is not, it's not actually debt accumulated, it's actually money stolen. What is research saying about this? Look, I think, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to Vinola's, mm. Vinola's position. A, a lot of, uh, the, the, perhaps the largest part of the debt that Eskom um, is, is under is because of the Madupian Kusilia new build 
Okay. So these huge coal-fired power stations that that are um, that have been built, um, huge cost overruns. They took years longer than they were supposed to have. Um, they were built on the basis of World Bank loans. So, so a large part of Eskom's debt is paying the interest on those loans. Okay. So, so I mean. Why I say I'm sympathetic to what Vianola is saying is that we've got to look and and think to ourselves: Is that debt that Eskom really needs to pay back, or can, could we make an argument that that is actually odious debt, which okay. Eskom should be exempt from, because it was debt that Eskom got into to build two huge coal-fired power stations? Um, you know, where, where that money should perhaps rather been, have been invested into building mm. solar, fa solar plants, wind farms, mm. et cetera, et cetera, which wouldn't have been nearly as costly. Okay, so, um, so I but, just want to... Comrade will probably disagree <laughs> with me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear. It's, 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 it's very important for all of us to understand that there was a decision that was taken, informed by an R IRP at that time, that said we need to construct this coal-fired power station and the cost that they would would be less than 100 billion if I remember correctly at mm -hmm. a time and when we talk of renewables and coal-fired power station we mustn't make a comparison and talk as if it is cheaper to construct renewables and to have renewables as a source we must be talking mm -hmm. about an energy mix that is okay. affordable because whilst we're addressing the issue of price, we must address the issue of availability and the base load. You have serious challenges with the renewables if you want to use them as base load in this country because during the peak periods, you do not have sun and wind. You mm. therefore cannot aggressively talk about the renewables. What we need to talk about is what went wrong from the decision that we took to say we are going to invest this much amount of money in these two mega projects in Metupi and Kusile, and how did we end up to almost three times the price that we, we, we said we are mm. going to be at? And if we address that, we will move away from the discussion of whether we should have ran into renewables other than having continued with the coal-fired power station. Mm. Okay, so um, I think one thing that I really want us to speak to is the impact that this has on the working class. What, what does this look like in the life of a working class person, Ms. Vinola, who now has to pay so, so much for electricity? How does that impact? Yeah, we, we have um, in, in our um, houses and, and, and checks in the, in the community and in, in the townships, we have people who must uh, fork out, um, they pay a, a whole hundred rand just for maybe um, 35 mm. units. And um, they also, it's uh, prepaid meters. Yeah. So if that is, is up, then it's up. Then they sit in darkness and in the winter it's very cold. Yeah. Um, energy is needed in order to cook for the family, um, for, for, for transport, for heating up. Mm. Um, the cup of coffee and for heating up the people. So yeah. there's, let's, a, let's there's a lot of impact on the dignity as well. Yeah, let's, let's hold it right there when we are speaking about how this ESCOM crisis is actually affecting the dignity of the working class. We'll be right back to pick up where we left off. <laughs> I'm still interested in actually finding the heart of it. I think sometimes what um, disconnects is that we are looking at, okay, it's load shedding, it's structured, it happens at this time, you know. But do how does this actually affect, say, the mine workers, but also? Can you give us an idea of that? Yeah. So I think it's important that we take this broader mm. than the effect that it has on workers, but rather to the general South African public, the effect that this has. Yeah. When you have unemployment sitting at beyond 27%, mm. meaning more than 6 million people are looking for employment, they cannot find it. Then you have a parastatal that is in crisis like ESCOM is, which is the primary driver of the economic activity and growth in mm. South Africa. You find companies not able to drive their production 
in the various sectors. And mm. the minute you have things like power purchase agreements and the electricity prices that are very ridiculous, one, as, as my colleague Vinolia put it here, you purchase 50 units of electricity by with 100 rand. Mm. What this does, it reverses the gains that ESCOM has aggressively got with respect to the accessibility of electricity by the public in that now mm. electricity becomes unaffordable mm. because of the decisions that were wrong which we have made. Because in the previous financial year, ESCOM by its own admission went to NERSA and asked for about 5.2% of electricity increases. These increases are amounts that must be paid by ordinary citizens. And us as the working class are the carriers and barriers of the electricity costs beyond the retrenchments that we get to be faced with whenever mm. electricity shortages get to confront the country and whenever the prices are to go up. Beyond that, the continuation of the poor purchase agreements under ESCOM mm. poses a bigger risk to ESCOM and mm. to the country. The government said they are going to inject about 23 billion over the next five years. There's no amount of injection that will solve ESCOM problems if we do not root out the real causes of where we are. And if okay. we continue brushing them off, the minute we do not take away the power purchase agreements from ESCOM, mm. we will continue having the public paying more. I will give you an example. Okay. The 60% of 5,2% that ESCOM got in the 2018 and 2019 went directly to the independent power producers. Then ESCOM went back to NERSA and said, we spent more, we need to recoup our money. That's why you would hear people talking about something that's called a pass-through. The danger of that is the people who are talking about this pass-through are mm. turning a complete blind eye to an ordinary citizen that is myself and yourself. And that's not justifying the existence of the renewables. And we must put this out there. We have no objection to the renewable energies, but we must mm -hmm. manage the issues of the energy mixes that we have in our country, putting patriotism and the interests of South Africa ahead of everything. But the narrative mm -hmm. that gets pushed out there is very dangerous. And certain powerful houses yeah. project the rest of the other mixes as not correct or appropriate for South Africa. Okay, this is quite a discussion that you do not want to miss out on. What stands out for me at this point is that we really need to root out the causes of this crisis. Join us again after this break. We are back and you are still watching a Workers' World. Tonight we are speaking about the ESCOM crisis and its impact on the working class. What has stood out so far is that maybe the answer is a mix um, of energy, of renewable energy, as well as the current system that we're using with coal. And Ms. Sandra had something to add on that. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the issue of, of renewable energy and particularly the cost of renewable energy. And I think mm. the reason why ESCOM is paying a high price for renewable energy, re renewable energy has been introduced into South Africa through what is known as the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers Procurement Program, which is quite a, a mouthful. Yeah. Um, and what happens, th there have been, I think, four bid windows, and each bid window it, it opens up the possibility for, for private companies to put in bids um, okay. to, win, to win tenders or to, to, to win contracts um, to, for, for, for to, to set up a solo plant or a wind farm um, and and that electricity that's generated in that way will be fed into the grid now okay. why why the electricity that Eskom is buying from those independent power producers is so expensive particularly from or, or, or from the first two bid windows particularly is because the cost of renewable energy at that time was was high 
Okay. But the cost of renewable energy has been steadily declining since then as the technology has got more sophisticated, it's developed more, et cetera, et cetera. But, but Eskom is obviously now tied into those power purchase agreements with those independent power producers. Okay. And so that's what keeps the, the cost of renewable energy for those early bid windows high. So I would make an argument that it is in fact Eskom that should be taking on renewable energy, that Eskom should be doing renewable energy. Um, and it would, it would solve a lot of problems if renewable energy was done, you know, p mm. partly through Eskom. Not, not only, I mean, I, I would also argue that, that municipalities could start doing renewable energy, that community organizations could do, do renewable energy. Um, but if Eskom was able to take on renewable energy in a, in a much more um, large scale, yeah. Um, it would also be a way for, for some of the jobs to be created um, and for some of the workers who, would lose, uh, who are going to lose their jobs when coal yeah. power plants are um, decommissioned, yes, yeah. they would be able to move over into renewable energy. Um, and it's a pity that when the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producers Program was introduced in, tw in the early sort of 2011 or before that by the government, mm. Eskom was not allowed to, to bid. Um, as, as part of the, the program. So, th so ESCOM has been sort of excluded from largely okay. from doing renewable energy. It seems, from what I've been reading, it seems that government is changing its mind now and, es and there is now talk, it seems, of, of ESCOM taking on renewable energy, which I think is, is, is fantastic. And I think that's mm. what we should be, be pushing for. Yeah, um, it is um, said that the government has proposed a restructuring of ESCOM um, and that they want to break it up into three separate entities. Can anyone actually like tell us more about that and how this is going to address the management crisis and the debt, or rather the apparent debt, as Ms. Vainola said? Look, the, the best suited people to answer that question mm is the ESCOM executives themselves. Mm. Because where we stand, we do not see how this is going to address the ESCOM problems. First and foremost, we are vehemently opposed to any attempt to privatize any part of ESCOM. Okay. If the intent to unbundle ESCOM is to get private equity partners who are going the wrong direction as okay. ESCOM and the country, Moreover, our understanding of the term unbundling is that you separate the, en the, the, the entities into mm -hmm. standalone with an intention of determining the price. Now, as to why we want to determine the price of those separate entities leaves a lot to be desired. But we know mm -hmm. that the minute you start finding equity partners, you then have ownership of a, pa a parastatal and national strategic asset and in the hands of the few private individuals, then you are trapped as a country. Okay. You are trapped as a country, the minute that happens. Then you are going to have job losses. M beyond that, you are going to have electricity that is very unaffordable and you'll have no say of what to do. And this reminds mm. me of a story of when Jamaica got its independence in 1962 when America proposed uh, when Jamaica wanted uh, uh, funding mm. from America, and America said, look, we'll give you this funding on a condition that you allow one-way trade, meaning it's only America that will trade with mm. Jamaica. At that time, Jamaica was the biggest producer of the dairy. They were specializing with milk. Then America advertised powdered milk in Jamaica, thus mm. destroying the dairy industry in Jamaica. Okay. Afterwards, the farmers of Jamaica suffered because they could not afford to compete against the publication and advertisement of powdered milk. And when the farming industry in Jamaica with respect to dairy died, the mm. price of powdered milk in, in Jamaica tripled. Mm. That is the direction that we're heading as the country if we allow the private equity partners and privatization of ESCO. And um, that just brings me back to the question of maybe including local organizations in um, maybe helping with the renewable energy production. Would that still be something that is opposed to, or is that more of a viable solution to this issue? Yeah, yeah just to come in there, um, I think the, the, the conversation now uh, gets into 
who is going to in whose interest are decision being made mm. whose money um, taxpayers money are being um, asked with when they ask um, for um, higher prices or electricity it's the people who pays mm. when when government have a bailout a loan or a, a bailout grant to escom it's taxpayers money mm. so we need to make sure that the poor and the, the people who are running this country who are working in the country mm. uh, is in um, benefiting as well but what what is pointed out here is that those big businesses um, that are now getting the big contracts mm. of the good energy we, we saying we want the good energy but mm. who benefits from that good energy we need to make sure that it's the people of South Africa mm. and those people that have been marginalized before mm. that must benefit and that's why we would rather opt for a more localized energy yeah. um, production energy generation and we can have our youth 50% of our yeah. youth unemployed, the highest okay. in um, many um, places. We will we'll get back right on this topic. I think this is very important. We need something that really um, benefits the people, and we will chat about this right after the break. So before the commercial break, Ms. Vinola, you were you asked a very critical question. Whose money is it that the government is lending to ESCOM? Um, continue from there. Yeah, the, the, the bailout, of course, it, it's from every cent of taxpayers' money yeah. that people are working hard. And um, some people, even if they earn little and have six children to, to feed, they still have to to um, take some of that and, and pay back to, to the country, thinking that this is going to social grants, it's going to education, it's going to housing, it is going to feed more people. But it is going into um, a structure that doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And that is the sad thing. Um, mm -hmm. Also, workers who are uh, um, in ESCOM that's busy restructuring. Restructuring is a very painful process. And sometimes mm -hmm. we have this debate and we say, the workers, they just want to keep and make sure that they, their workers stay there. Mm -hmm. They don't look at the climate and the um, environment care and so on. But the polarization of this, uh, this debate must end because there is um, 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 an African proverb that says, we did not inherit this earth from mm -hmm. our ancestors. We have borrowed it from our children. Mm -hmm. And we need to also live as if we uh, have in mind to our children's future and we cannot just look at our our own survival here and mm. our own wages and us staying in the situation in, in our comfortable situation sometimes we, we have to give up and for us mm. it is got to be a win-win situation and what sandra started to talk about earlier was the just transition if we have a transition of a new um, economy with a mm. new energy system we need to make sure that the workers currently employed in those bad energy coal sectors that they also are being treated with care, with dignity, because they have been slaving there to make sure that we have energy and that we don't have load shedding every, every, every 10 hours. And so we need to respect them that they are part of South Africans. Mm -hmm. They are also need to benefit from what our constitution say. And therefore, we need to start bringing that them in in the conversation. Yeah. That's why I really appreciate Workers' World having us all together instead of staying um, separately, we can yeah. sit next to each other and actually have a dialogue that workers is not here and the community and the, uh, those who care about climate change are here. Mm. The comrade has talked about he's not against renewables, but renewables must not be in the hands of elite companies only. Yeah. It must benefit the poor and it can benefit our communities, our youth. And we can have an ESCOM um, energy for us in. in Mm. in my organization, uh, SAFSI, the Southern African Faith Community Environmental Institute. Mm. Our, um, our primary um, um, going um, is for the caring of the earth, caring for all the living beings in, in the earth. And we can do that while also taking care of the socioeconomic future. And uh, energy is that one asset that we have in South Africa that we can restructure our whole economy. It's not just mm. energy. We can restructure our whole economy so that everybody benefit and we can then have an alternative way where it is not uh, um, the elite or a company that owns 
um, energy or owns the production mm. that everybody can be part and parcel and then we will all have a place in the sun yeah um, you know I, I agree with a lot of what I is saying but I think for me at the end of the day we need we're going to continue to need a state utility for energy we're going to continue yeah. to need ESCOM and why I'm saying that is because we are a country of huge inequalities we have uh, you know, geographic inequalities, inequalities within the same municipalities. Um, you know, we're one of the most uh, unequal uh, uh, countries in the world. Um, we, we've got high levels of energy poverty, uh, people who don't have access or don't have regular access to electricity. Now, we need a, 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 a state utility which is managing a national grid, which is, which is going to ensure that electricity is getting to all the different parts of the country that it, that 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 you need electricity, to, yeah. but I think what 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 the shift is over the last couple of decades is that we no longer have to get all our electricity from um, centralized coal uh, coal generated plants, so uh, electri electricity from coal generating plants. We, we, because of renewable energy, renewable energy can be much more localized, it can be diffuse, okay. it can happen at a local level, mm. it can have it happen at a utility level. Yeah. Um, and so I think ESCOM, in a, fu a future ESCOM, a transformed future yeah. ESCOM, is going to play an essential role in kind of managing that this electricity is being distri you know, tra tra mm. transmitted and distributed fairly, equitably. Well, we'll be right back. We're just going to pay the bills and we are going to continue right where we left off. Welcome back. You are tuned in to Workers World. Today's topic is the ESCOM crisis and its impact on more than the working class and actually the general public of South Africa. If you are just joining us, you've missed out on quite a bit. And this is our final segment of the show. And what I want to ask our panelists, maybe just if we can hear from each one of you, it seems that there is a lot that is going wrong, which is probably true for to an, a certain extent. But what are the solutions? What is there a way to reverse what has happened, or is there a way to kind of challenge what has happened at this point? Okay. Well, if, if, if I start, um, look, yeah. I think I think Eskom needs to be um, transformed. I think um, for me, a big starting point w for that would be dealing with the financial crisis, mm -hmm. but but also decorporatizing ESCOM. ESCOM was corporatized and turned into um, a kind of a, 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 you know, it now operates under the, the mm. Companies Act, etc., cetera, um, formally in 2001. And it needs to be decorporatized. It needs to be um, transformed back into a state utility uh, where possibly some kind of council oversees the operations of ESCOM. Mm. Um, you know, that council could have representatives from community, from labor, um, from different interest groups mm -hmm. um, on it. So I think, I think that transformation of ESCOM is something that, that needs to happen at all levels, financial, mm. governance, um, infrastructure. Um, I think a lot of work needs to be done in terms of how you can incorporate renewable energy, which is happening all mm. over the place. So people putting PV panels onto their roofs, um, solar water heaters, uh, you know, possibly, you know, there's some communities which are, or schools that are, that are um, becoming more self-sufficient in terms of energy through renewable mm. energy. We need to work out how all of that can fit into an energy, s an electricity system that can ensure equitable electricity for all. So that you don't, you know, I think, I think if we don't work out how that is done on an equitable basis, we run the risk of those who've got money um, putting PV panels on their roofs, mm. um, taking themselves more or less off grid, mm. y taking away that income from Eskom and local government because they're now no longer buying electricity from local mm. government or Eskom. 
Um, and they're fine. They'll, be, they'll do fine. And it's the working class and the poor who will be, who will be suffering because there's no cross-subsidisation cross anymore. Mm. So I think we have to look at those factors and see how we can have a more integrated community organisations, local government, ESCOM, playing a cohesive role, um, taking forward electricity, um, access to electricity in the future. Mm. Look, I think the... We can settle the debt of ESCOM tomorrow, mm. but we'll find ourselves in the very same position if we are not careful of the kind of people that we appoint into the executive positions. And this is not only the ESCOM chronic problem. Mm. It is a problem in multiple parastatals in this country mm. that we appoint people on the basis of who knows them, sometimes with absolutely no knowledge and experience in the parastatals that they are appointed to. Sure. Secondly, ESCOM needs to work tirelessly towards increasing what is called the energy availability effect. Because when it does that through the maintenance of the current plants, mm. it decreases the usage of OCGTs or what are called the open gas turbines where we burn an exorbitant amount of diesel. And moreover, we need to shift the power purchase agreements to another department other than ESCOM. Failure to do that, renegotiate the current approved and agreed upon bid windows to be not more than the cost price per unit at mm. ESCOM, so that ESCOM can also realize profits when it, pay, it takes this electricity from the power purchase agreements. We must settle the ESCOM debt, and mm. we must not allow the continuation of municipalities that enjoy electricity for free for, from, from ESCOM. Mm. And lastly, it, it, it was an insult to say ESCOM engineers and ESCOM is not capable mm. of managing and owning the renewables. This is Workers World, and thank you for joining us. And remember that you can reach us at 081-552-4551. The number again is 081-552-4551. From us at Workers World, Always remember From that a working class united will never be defeated.